Hello and welcome to a new edition of the Tasil podcast. Joining me today is Professor Shabir Akhtar. Professor Akhtar is a philosopher who was trained at Cambridge University. He has published widely on pluralism, political Islam, Islamophobia, extremism and interfaith dialogue besides Islam and Christianity's differing responses to the challenges of modernity. His books include The Light in the Enlightenment and his well-known Be Careful with Muhammad which is considered a classic critique of Salman Rushdie. Dr. Akhtar has also written The Quran and the Secular Mind which is the the main topic of today's discussion as well as Islam as a political religion. In 2018 he published The New Testament in Muslim Eyes Paul's Letter to the Galatians the first such work on the Greek New Testament in Islamic history. Professor Akhtar has published 3 volumes of poetry in English and has also lectured at universities in Malaysia, USA and the UK. His articles have appeared both in academic journals and in the UK press. Several of his books have been translated into the major Islamic languages. Since 2012, Dr. Akhtar is on the Faculty of Theology and Religions at the University of Oxford. He's a member of Regent's Park College. He's also a research associate at the Center for Muslim Christian Studies, Oxford. So, thank you professor for joining us and thank you for your time. Yes, you're welcome, Saad. I'm very happy to be uh, talking to you. Yeah. So, uh, before we actually dive into your philosophical book, The Quran and the Secular Mind, professor, uh, I think it would be fitting given the uh, that the occasion of the uh, the prophet's birthday being this month uh could you perhaps introduce your book be careful with muhammad a little bit which has been republished this time yes uh, be careful with muhammad was published uh, in 1989 during the height of the salman rushdie affair yes in the aftermath of the fatwa and the book burning <clears throat> and i was a campaigner and the book is a record of that campaign to have this uh, book removed from public uh, circulation we didn't succeed in that but i made a case uh, arguing that um, there was a conflict between uh, two unnegotiable principles that of the honor of the prophet for the muslims and that of uh, freedom of speech for the opponents of islam and i argued that freedom of speech was not an absolute right uh, already in law there are many limitations on it and we were asking for an extension of some of these limitations to cover muslim um, sensitivity and sensibilities but we did not succeed in that the new edition includes a very lengthy uh, 40 page preface yeah uh, showing what's happened the last 30 years and also of course the cartoon controversies that have uh, been happening for over a decade culminating in the Charlie Hebdo killings so i discussed the Charlie Hebdo affair as well and link it to Salman Rushdie who i think started this uh, attack this gratuitous uh, provocative attack on islam so my book is now 30 years on an account of what happened in those 30 years intervening after the book's uh, initial publication right and uh, I think what's what's uh, unique about your own writing style, uh, which are, which is something I noticed in Quran and Secular Mind, and I'm sure it's there in this book as well, that uh, you you um, make the reader shift between different frames of mind or different worldviews, and you present uh, an argument in its full strength, while also you know immediately following that you present the opposite argument in its full strength. So the, so you you're you're trying to give justice to the opponent's position. Uh, as much as possible yeah i think that's quite an accurate uh, description of my method i am a fair minded uh, uh, critic of positions with which i disagree which means positions such as um, some aspects of liberalism some aspects of christianity judaism and and the western outlook in general and i present a defense of orthodox sunni islam in all my writings that indeed is my self image and i um, of course yeah that's why i'm both a philosopher as well as a believer in islam that's my that's my stance yeah that's correct yeah and i also care about satire and style mm. evident in my book on 
Salman Rushdie. I don't see any reason why non-Muslims should have a monopoly on humor. Mm. Unfortunately, Muslims do have some sense of humor, but it's usually restricted to attacking their own clerical class. They don't seem to ever use this weapon to attack uh, Western yeah. liberals who mock Islam. I do that a great deal in my writing. Right. right. And uh, this is something I want to get on to maybe towards the end of the discussion uh, about your writing style, because your writing is, uh, at least, you know, the Quran and the Secular Mind is a pleasure to read as well, apart from the, the content and the argument. Thank you very much. Right. Um, well, before moving on to the Quran Secular Mind proper, uh, I think uh, I would, I, I mean, uh, let me just mention how I first encountered it because I read it about uh, eight years back and uh, it was quite stimulating at that time. And uh, even now, after all these years, it, it is uh, equally uh, as stimulating as it was and as engaging. Uh, and it's a, it's a very rewarding read. It's a, it's a, it's a dense book, but it also pays uh, a careful reading and uh, engagement with it. And uh, what, what also strikes me as unique about your style or method is you're not just talking about philosophy, but you're asking us to do philosophy in the process of reading the book. You're asking us to go through these arguments and through these th thought processes. Is that right, Professor? Yes, uh, that's correct. I'm not simply doing the history of philosophy, whether of Greek philosophy or of Islamic and Jewish philosophy. I actually engage the reader by doing philosophy myself. Um, so, for example, just to give you one example of that, uh, towards the end of my book, The Quran, The Secular Mind, I critique the work of David Hume, and I accuse him of philosophical double standards. So, for example, Hume admits that there's no proof for many of our commitments of common sense and of um, uh, our common moral, shared moral sense. It's a fortunate accident of, his, of instinct, he says, that we have some of these moral feelings of altruism. It's a fortunate accident of our nature, innate nature, that we can negotiate the physical universe without being penalized because we do not hold absurd opinions. For example, when I approach a cliff, I decide that uh, when I reach the edge, I won't go upwards. Instead, I know that I will go downwards. I don't have absolute proof for that because there could be an exception to the law of gravity, but I'm not going to test that experimentally. If I did, I'd be penalized, I would die. But he does not extend the same courtesy to religious conviction, which I think is also innate. Very few religious people, truly seven religious people, could ever doubt the commitments of their faith. These commitments were no different. These commitments were identical to the ones that ordinary people have to common sense beliefs about the reality of the world and the idea that the world is not plastic to our desires. If you confront the world, and pretend that the world problem isn't there. You'll be penalized for that uh, absurd uh, conviction. So I think that David Hume, although he's much admired, I think overrated in my view, I actually take him to task and accuse him of philosophical double standards in his discussion of miracles, in his discussion of the fact that humans have an innate um, tendency to believe in God, uh, arguably one God rather than many, and I show in my book in some depth that um, Hume is wrongly admired for these uh, claims. And that in fact, he was a, not a very good philosopher. So that's the kind of thing I do. I don't have awe for some you know, given chosen thinker. This is a big defect in uh, Western philosophy. People choose a single figure, like I did my doctorate on Soren Kierkegaard, but I don't think yeah. that Kierkegaard got everything right. Yeah, so I don't have an idolatrous intellectual attitude towards any thinker, including Muslim thinkers like, uh, you know, Ghazali, who I also criticize, right. and uh, including uh, Ibn Rushd, who I criticize a great deal, because I think he had more respect for Greek reasoning than he did for the Quran. Mm. Right. Uh, no, this is fascinating. And uh, we will, you know, eventually get into uh, the faith versus reason uh, discussion uh, you know, in, in in secular modernity as well as in Islam, and maybe comment on that. Uh, but uh, I, I think to characterize your book, the Quran and the Secular Mind, uh, 
while it is predominantly a book of philosophy, it also uh, discusses the history of ideas or, I mean, there, there is that element where you're uh, talking about the, the history of the uh, secular age or the uh, formation of the, of the modern secular self. And, uh, and, and then, you know, your book is also quite poignant as a as cultural, cultural commentary as well. So, I mean, there are all these diverse strands uh, and it, it's, it's quite a comprehensive, uh, uh, you know, assessment or a comprehensive commentary on, on these topics. Well, that's, that's right, uh, Saad. My ambition, the scope of my ambition was immense. And um, among the things I was trying to do was trace the evolution of the secular revolt against uh, Christianity and Judaism, and then try to see if there was a comparative uh, intellectual history, because I'm a historian of Islam, as well as a right. philosopher, yeah. to see what was the, uh, the equivalent uh, evolution of um, a thought in the Muslim camp. And of course, we have nothing remotely like the history that uh, Christianity has had to encounter both um, secular movements such as in the Enlightenment, and the Marxist attack, as well as the scientific uh, attack on, on the uh, fixity of species, meaning Darwin. Uh, we've had none of these uh, movements in Islam. Also, very significantly, I think that it's very extraordinary that after the revelation of the Quran, Islamic civilization has never developed an independent ethical system, except the one that is in the Quran and the prophetic exemplar. By contrast, Europe, has had many pagan schemes of ethics predating Christianity and many indeed pagan schemes of ethics which are after the advent of Christianity. There's lots of mm. movements such as utilitarianism and um, let's say Kantian emphasis on duty, although that's partly religious because Kant was a Christian, but many of them are independent of biblical ethics, uh, both Hebrew ethics as well as Christian. And predating Christianity, of course, you have many. The Aristotelian system of morality, which has been immensely influential, not only in its own right, but as an influence, as an independent force, they encountered the Judeo-Christian complex and the Islamic complex, the Islamic faith, all of whom had to accommodate themselves to this essentially pagan polytheistic wisdom. Uh, and there's been uh, movements such as uh, hedonism, skepticism, Skepticism as a lived philosophy, Stoicism among the Romans, mm. which of course inherited the Greek tradition intellectually. So we've had no such equivalent. There's not a single system of ethics in the Islamic world, which is entirely independent of the Quran. That's quite a remarkable achievement. Of course, critics would say that's proof of the fact that Islam is a religion that opposes enlightenment and progress and is therefore an obscurantist faith. But anyway, that's something that uh, we could discuss later on. Right. Um, right. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you also mentioned in the book that uh, there is perhaps no equivalent, I mean, there is no uh, in, intrinsic Quranic theology or, you know, something to that effect. You mentioned that, that theology is basically extrinsic to the Quran. That's correct, yeah. There's no theology in Islam. Uh, it's a major mistake. Um, there is, of course, uh, Kalam, uh, which is dialectical uh, reasoning about doctrine. And these are debates internal to Islam about the nature of free will, uh, predeterminism, the nature of the Quran, whether it's co-eternal with God or created in time and space. These are valid disputes, some of which have their origins within the tradition of Islamic thinking. But the idea of theology, the word theology means the study of God or the study of the nature of God. Christianity is a theological religion par excellence. It is a highly developed theology, partly because it doesn't have any interest in the law. Remember the whole point of my commentary in Galatians is, yes. why did Paul think that the inherited law of the Torah from Judaism is uh, obsolete and redundant? Christianity doesn't need a law. It just needs grace, the grace of God, the grace of God in Christ. Islam does have a law. It's a law-centered faith. And I personally think that the Quran is actually contains what I've invented a new word called ergotology from the Greek word for 
action, practices, or works. Because the Quran basically says, those who believe, Allah din amanu, wa aminu heart, and perform righteous actions. So these are uh, an organic amount of them. The ergotology, if I may use a new word, is the study of the nature of virtuous and vicious action, good and bad deeds. That's what the Quran is actually interested in. In other words, the Quran is a revelation of the moral and legal will of God for humanity. Insofar as this requires God to reveal something of his nature, obviously he does through the various sifat or attributes of God. But the idea of theology as the study of the nature of God, essentially metaphysical speculation, is entirely foreign to Islam. And in fact, the word theology is no Arabic equivalent. Um, theology itself is a word. It occurs in, uh, in Aristotle in a different form. Um, theoi, logioi, the study of the gods, plural, because of course, uh, he was a polytheist. Yeah. Yes. So and indeed, there's a word in Greek for theology, which means the study of the goddess, not of God, but the female goddess. So again, we have none of these ideas in Islam. Strictly speaking, theology is blasphemous. But of course, I know that it hurt the professional pride of people who have titles such as professor of Islamic philosophy or oh. Islamic theology, sorry, I meant at some university. Obviously, this would uh, destroy their, their careers. So therefore, they're dishonest and they pretend that such a subject exists when it doesn't. Right. And uh, I think this uh, this is also deeply related to something which we will soon discuss, uh, which is the uh, perhaps the reason why we do not have an Islamic theology, perhaps for the same reason we, we cannot have an Islamic prophetology or uh, an inquiry into the nature of prophecy. So this is something you discuss uh, where you compare Kenneth Craig's views of uh, the prophetic experience. Uh, to an Islamic model of revelation. I, I mean, I, I see these two as related uh, because in, in both the instances, you're, you're trying to delve into the nature of the ghaib or the unknown, the un unknowable, uh, and you're trying to speculate about it. Well, the, uh, the debate with Kenneth Craig, whom I knew, by the way, as a, right. as a friend whom I admired, was a great Christian student of, of Arabic literature and of the Quran. Um, and there's a God-fearing man, in fact. My d d disagreement with Kenneth Craig was the same as my disagreement with Fazlul Rahman, another uh, great Muslim and scholar who died in exile, as you know, in Chicago. My, my disagreement is on the point that both of these men confused the genesis of revelation with the interpretation of revelation. These are entirely different. The genesis of the Quran as Revelation, wahi in Arabic, which means inspiration, or tanzil, which means literal descent of revelation. I believe that the genesis of that is wholly, 100%, from start to finish divine. Um, whereas Craig's view was that this is a mechanistic model of revelation. It's not dynamic. And I said that uh, you don't need dynamism in discussing the genesis of a revelation. You need dynamism in discussing its human interpretation. So even the prophet was actually the first human interpreter of the Quran, obviously very privileged because he's the man to whom the book was given as well. Whereas other people who came after him were interpreters of a book, which wasn't originally vouchsafed to them. You know, he came with the Quran, not in the sense which one goes to a bookshop and buys a copy of the Quran, but meaning it was uh, revealed to him. It was imprinted on his heart. Uh, so my argument was that while the Quran was being revealed on the heart of the prophet, his own intellectual, literary and human faculties were suspended. That's the psychology of inspiration. And both Fazlur Rahman and uh, Craig had a different view of the psychology of prophetic inspiration. They believed that this inspiration did not bypass the prophetic Mohammedan mind or psyche, but went through it and was influenced by it. In my mind, that is incorrect because it introduces human and therefore fallible variables into the genesis of the revelation. Of course, all in human interpretation is fallible. And it may be an arguable question. It may be argued, contested, whether the prophet's own interpretation was fallible. Obviously, that's a very tricky question of doctrine. Right. But there's no question that the 
human interpretation of the Quran by everybody else, including great companions of the Prophet, is definitely fallible. It's not infallible, but the revelation itself in its genesis is infallible because it's wholly human. So it's wholly divine. It has no human component. The moment you introduce a human component into a revelation, even if that human component is defined as being infallible because it's under the grace of God, you cannot then absolutely exclude the possibility of error. And I'm trying to exclude the very possibility of error. One of the implications of my view, however, is that unlike other revelations such as the Bible, the two testaments of the Bible, the Quran is unusual in that since it's pure revelation, if you could show a single error in it, either morally or historically or factually or otherwise, or a contradiction, it would undermine the authority of the book. So that's quite a high stake, isn't it? Unlike the Bible, I mean, there's countless, there's numerous contradictions in the Bible uh, and errors, outright errors, but that is not necessarily undermined the total authority of that book because it's not considered a pure revelation. It's considered partly humanly inspired because it goes through the minds of the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, etc. And Paul's mind is inspired by Christ, but that in my view doesn't entail it is entirely uh, infallible. In fact, Paul admits that his mind is sometimes giving verdicts that are not from God. Whereas the Quran from start to finish is the literal speech of God meaning this is what God himself says. And for, for that to be the case, it mustn't contain any errors. That doesn't mean, by the way, that the Quran is culture-free or language-free. Of course it's not. It was given to a particular culture, 7th century Arabia, a pagan culture, in which a civil war took place because of the advent of the Quran. Arab tribes fought each other and saw the emergence of Islam as of Abrahamic monotheism. Uh, and it's not free of language. I mean, Arabic is a human language, although it has a sacred employment in the Quran, in its Fusa classical form, that particular form of the, in the which it's used in the Quran. But Arabic itself is a, is a language. And don't forget, Arabic was the language of Arab Christianity long before it became the sole and important liturgical language of Islam. Uh, in fact, the Quran is the world's most liturgically rehearsed scripture. It is constantly being recited all the time, everywhere for 1400 odd years. And therefore it has lived up to its name as Al-Quran, the recital. Anyway, that's enough. I mean, there's a lot of technical detail right. in the book and in my articles attacking Kenneth Craig and also, you know, in a friendly way, attacking Fazlur Rahman, whom I regarded as misguided on this point. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah, I think, uh... We, when we're speaking about the um, the psychology of prophetic inspiration, uh, there's an interesting segment in the book where you uh, bring Nietzsche to the rescue, uh, and and he's essentially drawing upon the the Greek idea of uh, of of inspiration. Can you elaborate on that, Professor? Well, of course, to quote Nietzsche the greatest uh, atheist philosopher uh, is a discrepant ally. One shouldn't uh, invoke his name in, a, right. in an attempt to show the truth of an Islamic doctrine. But here he's, uh, he, he has respect to the Greek idea of ecstasis, from which we get the word ecstasy. Ecstasis means literally standing outside oneself. He thinks that uh, there's a coercive externality to real revelation. The poets, for example, become possessed. Although we don't hold that opinion, because as you know, poets are much known or possessed by the jinn, the elemental beings. But the Quran does imply that uh, while the prophet is not a poet, of course, a shayad, but it does imply that um, when the prophet is receiving the revelation uh, through the agency of, uh, uh, of Gabriel, uh, that the prophet's own faculties are suspended during that period. And indeed, the prophet himself gives this testimony when he's asked about how the revelation comes to him. He says that it's a heavy burden on him, that it is a very, very difficult experience. And in fact, the Quran itself says this, uh, Had we revealed this Quran on a mountain, you would have seen it shattered out of the fear of God, implying the spiritual stamina of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, what an extraordinary man he was, that he could bear the weight of the Holy Word. Uh, the Kaulan Thakilan, uh, 
yeah. the Quran calls it out, the heavy word, yeah? Right. Um, and so in that sense, it's true that the uh, Greek idea also was that the, that the word of inspiration was external, coercive, and couldn't be doubted, and it put a special burden on the poet. Uh, but without the bit about the demon possession, or in the case of the Greeks, they all all Greek poetry is attributed in a joint authorship to an agency called the Muse. So a poet would say mm. that the Muse had visited him, sometimes in the form of a woman. Uh, as in secular poetry, you can dedicate a, a poetic work to a woman whom you love and attribute it to her as, as your Muse. It's a it's a secular euphemistic borrowing from the Greek idea of a literal muse, but the Quran is not co-authored. Its uh, uh, author is not the prophet plus uh, God. It's simply and solely the work, word of God. It has no co-authorship. And that's an important point. So there I do uh, invoke Nietzsche, who says about, well, of course, uh, he says about, particularly his last book, Eke Homo, his yeah. autobiography, which is two, written two weeks before he went insane, that that work is basically an inspiration in the Greek sense, though naturally he didn't believe in the supernatural, but he's saying that he felt possessed by an external power. Yeah. Right. And uh, I think this, uh, just to uh, mention this as a reference, uh, I think uh, this point about the uh, the ecstasis or the, the ex externality of the of, of revelation is something which is uh, uh, Malik Benabi, the Moroccan sociologist, had a book on the, on this topic the, called the Quranic phenomenon, where he's 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 just uh, making a case for this exact point, where uh, which is quite obvious when you uh, see the, the prophetic life and when you read the Quran that this is an uh, I mean at least uh, for the prophet uh, from from the prophet's point of view himself. This was an external event, and uh, he was not uh, consciously, uh, of course, making it up. Yes, not only that, he couldn't ignore it. Right. Okay. Uh, it's um, external and coercive, compelling. It's a bit like um, if you have a very profound religious experience. Like, for example, Paul claimed that he had an experience of the risen Christ, where he fell off his horse. Paul fell off his horse. He couldn't then simply ignore it and uh, say, I was just, uh, I didn't know how to ride a horse. He has to attribute it to this externality of Jesus Christ. So this is a, a normal thing in the religious life that um, God, when he wants to claim someone such as Moses, he shows him an epiphany or appearance uh, or manifestation that's so powerful that uh, the person can no longer ignore it. In that sense, God overrides the free will of his chosen servants. He doesn't do that with ordinary believers like us. We can have a sign from God, uh, which is quite compelling and powerful, but we can still, in our sinful perversity, decide to ignore it and continue to lead a sinful life, uh, even after that event. Uh, that's because we have the privilege of free will. But it's overridden in the case of seminal figures. Yeah, that's correct. And well, of course, this this question is also important if we want to preserve the uh, the the divine uh, uh, origin or, or the divine nature of the Quran, uh, where we need to preserve it from any element of human uh, involvement or human fallibility. Uh, and so this this brings us to the the question of uh, how does the Quran presents itself as being uh, a divine or a sacred or, or you know, as, as being an inspiration from uh, God. And uh, of course, the, the Quran, th there's this discussion on the literary ijaz or the miracle or what you term actually the, the book as frustrator. Can you uh, possibly uh, elaborate on? Yeah, absolutely. Well, actually, yeah, strictly speaking, uh, the Quran is uh, a mu'jiza, which means uh, the frustrator. Uh, the, the word frustration is, is a Latin adverb, ad frustra, which means something done in vain, where you don't achieve a purpose. The Quran's self-description is that 
this is the book of Revelation or Tanzil, direct descent from God. And they challenge all poets and writers that they cannot write like that. Uh, and that it challenges the uh, human poets of this day to write something similar and says that you cannot do it. Um, the idea here is that the book frustrates literary capacity in the human being. So the book incapacitates us from, as writers uh, and poets, to come up with a, a marvel of the same kind. In other words, the Quran, the Quran's credentials for its truth and provenance as divine are aesthetic or literary, which is very remarkable. Uh, no other book claims that. The New Testament, by the way, is not written in um, classical Greek, but in koine, which means demotic, ordinary Greek. There's a joke by Nietzsche, who was a classicist, that it was subtle and clever of God to learn Greek when he wanted to become a writer, and equally uh, clever of him, and equally clever of him not to learn any better, not to learn it any better. He's implying that the Greek of the New Testament is very poor Greek, whereas by contrast, the Quran's Ejaz actually is based on the Quran's claim to supremacy of literary taste in Fusha Arabic, right? That's the whole point, that uh, the, the, the Arabic is so elegant and uh, uh, therefore uh, unimpeachably uh, uh, powerful, aesthetic. And of course, this is in fact a, a fact of its visual and uh, auditory impact. When the Quran is recited, especially in a, a crowd, uh, in a holy precinct like uh, Masjid al-Aqsa or uh, the Prophet's Mosque by a distinguished reciter such as the late, uh, you know, Sheikh Abdul Basit. Uh, there's a spiritual force that's unleashed. And I don't mean just for believers. Many unbelievers have converted to Islam simply by hearing the, the recited word. They, they could tell this wasn't an ordinary human achievement. And of course, there's no instrumental music involved in the recitation of the Quran. Another remarkable fact of of Tajweed, the, the, uh, the um, sensational display of the Quran's beauty. Some for Wahhabis actually object to it because they think this might mislead someone into loving the Quran because of its sound. And indeed, it's an aesthetic uh, uh, miracle is what the Quran is saying. And when it's properly recited, uh, many people have attested to its power. The most famous descriptions by Marmaduke Pectol, the first Englishman, uh, Scottish Englishman, yeah. who is a translator of the Quran, but also believed in the inspiration of the Quran because before him, people who translated the Quran were disbelievers. And he says that the Quran is, quote, that inimitable symphony, the very sounds of which move men to tears and ecstasy, end of quote. That's a lot of praise. Right, right. Uh, no, th um, this is fascinating. And uh, especially the, the chapter where you have this discussion. Uh, but what's also interesting about the chapter is that I mean, it seems as if you're leaving us with more questions than, than answers, which I, I suppose that's the uh, that that's how philosophy uh, goes about its business. And uh, I mean, can you can you possibly comment on on some of these these questions for that that come up when we are, we're trying to conceptualize what the literary ajaz or the mojiza could be? Uh, and when yes, I can. Right. Um, well, it's a big field, Malaga, you know, the field of Quranic rhetoric or Arabic rhetoric or eloquence, the art of eloquence. And um, in uh, both in Greek and in Arabic culture, some forms of eloquence are dangerously close to magic. Uh, a speech can be uh, so eloquent that it's magical. It can cast a spell on you. So one has to be careful. Um, now, the difficulty is that if you have a book which claims to be the word of God simply on grounds of its literary beauty, it's not a conclusive argument. Because somebody could say that some of the works of Shakespeare or Dickens are very beautiful or those, you know, in, uh, of Iqbal or one of the Farsi poets like uh, Firdosi um, or he, others like Hafiz uh, and well, countless others. Attar, Nizami, there's lots of Persian poets who are considered um, uh, geniuses of the word, uh, of the Farsi language. That is, you know. And of course, therefore, it's a, not a conclusive argument to say that the Quran is beautifully written. Even if it's inimitably beautiful, it is still within the range of human achievement. But because the, the Quran uh, 
combines this claim with the fact that truth resides not in a syllogism, not in a set of propositions which are premises whose validity and soundness can be assessed. But it says essentially that the truth of Islam resides in the moral perfection of the character of the Holy Prophet who led a morally perfect life. The Quran says that uh, we who have a Uswatun Hasana, you have a perfect, beautiful exemplar in the life and behavior of the Prophet. The, the context is actually the battle of the trench where the Prophet showed exemplary patience, where he showed um, both um, um, magnanimity and patience in the hour of eclipse and defeat. He's remarkable as a general, by the way. He knew how to take defeat. He showed exemplary patience. And of course, as a victorious general, he also showed magnanimity and forgiveness to his enemies, which is another thing that many so-called uh, great generals like Alexander didn't show. Alexander was very fond of killing people. As you know, the prophet gave a general amnesty in the most bloodless revolution in human history, the conquest of Mecca under the prophet's leadership. So that's another thing that the Quran is saying that the man to whom we've given the book, because remember the Quran is reliably associated with the single historical figure called Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Um, I mean, you can add uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but you know, my discussion here is not devotional. So I'll let the readers who are Muslim add it themselves. But the point is that his achievement is phenomenal. You know, he basically eliminated idolatry in the Arabian Peninsula in a mere 22 years, something which Jewish prophets couldn't do for millennia. Uh, you still have idolatry persisting among the children of Israel for despite hundreds of messengers. Whereas one single messenger achieves that in a mere 22 years. There's, this cannot be a human achievement. So there's two credentials I'm saying joint. Character of the prophet, which is morally perfect, and the inimitability of the Quran's literary style. You need both. Yeah, right. But, uh, right, I mean, uh, that's there. And uh, what's also there in the book is uh, some counter arguments to these exact points which you bring up. And uh, uh, I mean, I'm not sure to what extent they're, they're resolved in the, in the chapter itself. Uh, because, I mean, for example, on the question of the, uh, the literary superiority of the Quran, uh, you, you raise the question that this could potentially be a subjective test. Uh, and perhaps it's not something which can be established objectively or empirically. Um, is that, well, is that, that, that? Well, that's true. It is, ultimately. But that doesn't mean that it's an arbitrary test. Of course. Yeah. I mean, after all, the Arabs were connoisseurs of poetry and language. Uh, so therefore, the fact that the contemporaries of the Prophet were dislocated by the Quran. Look at how many different accusations they make. He's a poet. No, no, he's a magician. He's a kahin, soothsayer. Uh, do you notice that there's a confusion? Because the genre of the Quran is unique and it dislocated Arab listeners. So therefore, we know there was a challenge. It's not the way, you know, Orientalists, uh, non-Muslim Orientalists, who have a very shaky command of Arabic, pretend that the Arabic of the Quran is poor. How can they make such a judgment? It's yeah. a bit like um, someone who hardly knows any English, let's say a migrant, coming and telling English people about the quality of Shakespeare's plays. We know that that judgment is invalid. So I'm not saying it's subjective in the sense of being arbitrary. Right. I'm saying it's not ultimately decisive, as mm -hmm. I pointed out, that you can't argue from the beauty of a text to its truth, because what is beautiful can still be false. And what is ugly may sometimes be true. Right. Yes. Um, and of course, the the traditional relation between beauty and truth is also something which has been severed in the modern age. It's severed, yeah. We don't believe in such a link anymore. Right. Uh, and in fact, um, in terms of the theory of knowledge, it is possible for God to make abnormal choices. For example, it is possible for God, because he's God, uh, to choose an evil and sinful man as the instrument of his holy will. He doesn't in fact do that. The prophets were not even self sinful men. They were good men. And the women who were chosen, Moses' mother, the mother of Jesus, 
were good women. But I'm saying it is possible, though paradoxical, for example, to choose an evil and sinful man, an ordinary man, and uh, make him a prophet. And during the experience of prophet, that man could alter his character, or he may not. God can. God has every right to. Uh, I mean, God, of course, has the absolute privilege and prerogative to send to send a virtuous monotheist to hell. Right. That's an Asherite view, by the way. It's right. my own view as well. Okay. It's my own view, yeah. Because right. I do not believe that God is bound by the moral law. Right. No, uh, this this reminds me of, of another point that comes up in the book where uh, you're discussing the types of errors in scripture, uh, and particularly in biblical scholarship. And yeah. uh, I think, uh, was it St. Augustine who says uh, at some place that uh, God deliberately made these scriptures uh, seem uh, untrue so that, I mean, it could be like a test of your faith. Is that, is that something uh, so that he says? Well, yes, that's true. It is an Augustinian view, but it's also been promulgated in several um, encyclicals, uh, meaning papal letters uh, officially. Yes, that's correct that God built in certain errors, apparent errors, into the Bible so that it became an intellectual test. Just as we are tested in our bodies through physical desire for appetite, such as food and sex, uh, like the Prophet Yusuf was tested in the area of sexuality. And of course, being a chosen servant of God, he successfully resisted temptation that most of us probably wouldn't be able to. But the mind is also tested. So it's possible to entertain intellectual ideas that are blasphemous and you must uh, therefore try to resist it. In other words, the, the Quran invites human beings to use their reason or akal, but it doesn't invite them to use their akal unconditionally or in a wanton way. It is akal, the office of reason, but it is supervised by the higher office of iman or faith. So philosophy is unaided intellect, meaning Wherever the unaided reason takes you, you must go. But Islam doesn't accept that. That's why there's a conflict between being a Muslim believer and a philosopher. And in my view, most of the Islamic philosophers were actually not believers, with a few exceptions. We may talk about it later if you want. Right. That's a kind of retrospective fatwa of takfir or kufr on them. So it might be a bit sensitive for some of your listeners, but I don't hesitate to pass such a fatwa on people especially on fellow thinkers. Right. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be so solicitous of, the, of, of those who, who would uh, fall under the uh, impious philosophers, but, but, but I'm certainly interested in, in, in who you think you, you would class as uh, those who are, who are pious philosophers, if, to use that term. Yes. Well, of course, the, yeah. <laughs> the pious philosopher was the founder of philosophy, Yaqub al-Kindi, is the only ethnically Arabian philosopher from a noble lineage. And he was a defender of Islam, as well as a true thinker. Um, he uh, achieved a number of remarkable things, one of which was that he developed a nomenclature in Arabic, um, in his falsfal ula, the first philosophy, where he wants to know certain Greek uh, terms, how they can be put into Arabic, and secondly, he argued against the ulama that there was nothing wrong with learning wisdom from pagan sources, right? In other words, you can go right. into the ulama of Wa'il, the sciences of the ancients, which here means Greeks, and you can learn from them because uh, mm. as the prophet himself, possibly in disputed tradition says that, you know, the knowledge is the lost property of the believer. You can go as far as China to find it. Certainly the Quran encouraged the enterprise of science, asked us to explore the world and to look for the signs of God behind nature sequences. And that gave a big push to the development of, to the development of empirical science, sadly not to its institutionalization. That occurred among Europeans. One of the great failings of Islamic culture, that we don't know how to make institutions, uh, except for the first generation who were very good at it. Uh, even though the institutions were rudimentary, they managed to conquer two empires which were very advanced in their bureaucracies, perhaps too advanced, because a bloated bureaucracy is every bit as bad as no bureaucracy or no institutions. That's a great puzzle of history, and I deal with it in my book, Islam as Political Religion, the Future of an Imperial Faith, where I defend Islamic imperialism against its critics. Right. 
Right. Uh, and th there's also uh, an interesting point that uh, uh, perhaps it is uh, political um, weakness or political um, empowerment, which has led, led to a decline in our self-confidence as Muslims. And therefore, even when it comes to knowledge, we are afraid to explore new territories. And uh, you, I think you, you, you mentioned in the book that this is also a function of power. When you're in power, then you're, you have the necessary confidence required to make, uh, you know, be, be intellectually adventurous, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. There's proof of that. The golden age of the Abbasid, uh, Beit al-Hikmah, uh, right. the, the translation of Greek into Arabic and indirectly, which inspired the Renaissance in Europe, all was done under Muslim patronage uh, because um, uh, intellectual curiosity is a byproduct of political power. People marvel at the West's uh, intellectual curiosity. They forget that the West also the near monopoly on nuclear weapons and the ability where, mm -hmm. where the pen doesn't work. The pen is not mightier than the sword. The pen is mightiest with the sword. When Western arguments don't work, they usually bomb a country. Mm -hmm. That's the great wisdom of the West, which Muslims unfortunately have lost. Right. And I mean, speaking of the golden age and the uh, you know, Muslim advances in science, when you, when, you, when you contrast that with the present Muslim attitude towards science, and I mean, particularly when, you know, there's this, this particularly modern trend where uh, modern science uh, is trying to be smuggled into the pages of the Quran, and you're, you're, you're trying to read these modern discoveries uh, into the scripture. Can you comment on that? I think you, you have a, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite, an, quite an eloquent passage actually in the book, which uh, where you dis discuss this. Yes, that's right. It's a, it's a mistaken method. The Quran is not primarily a work of empirical science, but its claims are broadly compatible with our findings in, in the, in the, in the uh, social and natural and human sciences, including cosmology. It doesn't say anything that's flatly denying the big picture. Although somebody might argue that it is on the question of evolution, for example, fixity of species uh, and upon the age of the planet. Quran makes no comment on the age of the planet, but um, so again, unlike the Bible, which seems to. Um, but there is some uh, tension admittedly between the modern uh, findings of empirical science uh, about human nature, as well as about the cosmos that are in conflict, but there's no uh, statement in the Quran that flatly denies uh, scientific findings. On the other hand, to read uh, obviously spiritual passages of the Quran, and then to read some empirical meaning into them relating to embryology. You know, we created you in three layers of darkness, the Quran says. To identify these with three types of membrane, uh, like Morris Mukai did, I think that's naive and incorrect. Because what it actually implies is that the authority of the world's most culturally esteemed method, which is currently science and its auxiliary technology, is to be used to judge the authority of the revelation. Well, that puts the Quran into second place because then something is sitting in judgment on the authority of the word of God. And that's obviously an un-Islamic conclusion. I think Muslims don't think deep enough about these matters to know where they're heading. So they get very excited and they read um, meanings into a text of the Quran saying that the Quran has already predicted microbes and alien travel and all kinds of adventures things. None of that is true. Right. The verses of the Quran do not support that. Um, there is also, as a PS to this, by the way, another program that has similar weaknesses, but whose weaknesses are not evident, which is associated with the late Ismail al Faruqi's Islamization of knowledge. Right. The idea being that you can derive entire disciplines such as economics and psychology from single stray verses of the Quran. Again, that's misguided. What we need to do as Muslims is to get out there along with the other uh, uh, nations of the world like the Japanese or the Americans or the British, etc., and send our own uh, spaceships and to gain new empirical knowledge about the cosmos, be at the forefront of knowledge about uh, to do with the um, let's say genetic engineering or eugenics or biomedical ethics, whatever 
the secular world is good at, we should be better at it. But sadly, that's not the case. We've fallen behind. I mean, my argument in the in the companion volume to this art, uh, to the Quran Secular Mind, which is an entirely philosophical work, yeah. without politics, is that when Muslims had power in the world, political power, they gave the world a stable political order, particularly in Palestine, Israel, for close to 500 years under Ottoman rule. When they became weak and uh, powerless, then they gave the world terrorism and instability and ignorance. So they can't even debate simple points and make reasonable concessions to modernity. They get all worked up. You know, even if you ask them, look, there's lots of issues about women's rights. It's very clear that some of these are patriarchal and violate the spirit of the Quran, which is a, a doctrine of the highest ethical import and gives men and women lots of rights. True women as well, remarkable number of rights. And Muslim countries are denying those rights. And so when you do that, Muslims get all worked up. That itself is a proof that they're weak because if they were confident and strong in their faith and were leaders of knowledge and technology, they wouldn't have such an attitude. So when we were weak, we gave the world terrorism. When we were strong, we gave the world scholarship and political stability. I say to the Western powers, you choose which type of Islam you want. Unfortunately, they're hell bent, hell bent on trying to create a, what they call a moderate Islam. Their definition of moderate simply means that it's a form of religion that poses no threat to their vested economic interests. No matter how extremist it is, in other words, you know, with puppet regimes, torturing Muslims. But the word moderate should be used in the sense of wasatiya, which is an Arabic master or noun. As you know, it is in the Quran. We have created you as a middle nation, middle between Jewish legalism and Christian antinomianism, where they've done away with the law completely. You are in between. You follow the law, and you respect the higher purpose of the law, right? Unfortunately, again, we have another subversive secret movement, what's called progressive Islam in America, which is using the maqasid al-sharia, the higher purposes of the Islamic law, such as the preservation of life and intellect and lineage, to undermine the positive content of the sharia. Now, to me, that's an act of apostasy. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I think... Hmm. I mean, just I mean, before we uh, get on to these really fascinating themes, uh, if we can just come back to the 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 discussion where um, yeah, we're I mean, when when you talk in, speak in the book about the uh, you have a discussion on the uh, scope of the book and uh, about the Quran being an Arabic Quran. And what what are the philosophical implications of the Quran having been revealed in Arabic? Because you mentioned in the, in the book that uh, each language brings with it its own metaphysics and its own categories of thought. Uh, and what does it entail for you know divine revelation to be uh, in the particular language of Arabic? And of course, related to this, uh, can, you, uh, what is the I mean, to what extent is Arabism intrinsic to Islam, or to what extent can be uh, removed or you know distinguished from the essence of the of the religion? Yeah, these are good questions. Um, the the expression Arabic Quran in Nanzal Nahu Quran and Arabian is a Quranic one repeated often. It's the self image of the Quran that this is an Arabic lecture. Uh, and in fact, the word Arajami, which means non-Arab or non-eloquent or Persian, is used in the Quran once um, uh, because it's part of a racial uh, witticism in the Quran that if we sent a uh, Quran and Arajami to an Arab people, then it, the Arabs would have laughed at it and say, that's absurd. You know, we are Arabic speakers, pure Arabic, uh, Quran, Mubin, clear Arabic, uh, clear Quran, uh, if we, you know, Arabian Mubin in plain Arabic. These are all Quranic expressions. Right? It's not my own expression that the Quran is an Arabic Quran. The Quran proudly mentions this fact. So this creates a problem because you might say if it's an Arabic Quran, why should it be addressed to the entire human race? Not the entire human race is not Arabic speaking. Indeed, I'm not an Arab. My knowledge of the language is because of my uh, belief in Islam as a faith. And incidentally, conversely, people are born as... Uh, 
Arabs have no real advantage in understanding the Quran's Arabic. It's a bit like being born an Englishman. It doesn't mean you automatically know Shakespeare's English, right? It's a very difficult type of English. So the Quran's Arabic is extremely difficult, uh, as anybody who spent a lifetime, as I have, uh, trying to understand it. And in fact, you often find Ahl al-Arab, people who are native to Arabic, know very little about the Quran's use of idioms and uh, sentence structure. Okay, so that's the first point. That it is a self-description of the Quran. This is not the critic's orientalist description or an external critic, yeah? It's the Quran itself. Right. Uh, the general principle in the Quran, Surah Ibrahim mentioned this, is that we have always sent a messenger in the language of his own people. So from that we deduce that presumably the Torah was in Hebrew, because that was the language of Moses. And that the uh, um, gospel, Al-Injil, would have been in Aramaic, the mother tongue of Jesus which conflicts with the Christian claims that the New Testament is in Greek, uh, because of course, if the language of Jesus' his mother tongue is Aramaic, which incidentally is a dialect of Hebrew, uh, just as Aramaic is a dialect of Syriac, and they're all members of the Western Semitic family, including Arabic, so they're all related to each other. Um, so we have this problem in a sense that if the Quran is um, addressed to the entire human race, indeed to uh, the jinn as well. Why is it in a given human language, Arabic, which has its own metaphysics, as I say in the book. And I, I have a big discussion of that. And I look at Aristotle's claim on this point about how language and metaphysics are related. And I go all the way up to Wittgenstein. Right. So that's a technical discussion for people who, who love philosophy, analytical philosophy, which is what I was trained in at Cambridge, uh, as mm -hmm. I mentioned. As you mentioned your introduction. Uh, now, the, the difficulty is this, that if a book is revealed at a given point in history to one generation, how does it transcend its linguistic and cultural context and become relevant to the human condition, as opposed to the local Arab condition of one people in South Central Arabia? And I discussed this at some length in this chapter called The Scope of the Book. Well, the basic argument there, which I subsequently developed in articles of it as well, is that the fact that something is set in a given culture in a different language or in a given language does not actually restrict its scope. Think of how a book such as Charles Dickens' uh, Oliver Twist is read throughout the English-speaking world and courtesy of colonialism throughout the entire world. Does that mean that the character of Oliver Twist can only be understood by people who are born and raised in England? Of course not. Mm. He's almost a universal character. So the same can happen if this can happen to a a fictional character, then why can't it happen um, in the context of revelation? What the Quran actually does, for example, take a prominent example of how the Quran universalizes ethnic narratives. It takes the story of Joseph and of Moses, both of which occur in the Hebrew Bible, and there they are narrated in an ethnic context with ethnic relevance, you know, as simply as guidance for the Hebrews. In the Quran, the story of Joseph is moral wisdom for the entire human race. So that Joseph is a moral hero. He's not a Hebrew hero. He's celebrated as a Hebrew hero who outwits the Egyptians in the Torah, in the book of Genesis. In the Quran, nothing like that. The Quran has all these various moral maxims. Every time it has told us a bit about the life of Yusuf alayhi salam, it says, uh, thus do we reward all good doers. It says, you know, the evildoers never prosper after the seduction scene where Yusuf resists temptation. Evildoers never succeed. A warning to adulterers, all adulterers, any human being who's tempted by adultery. So you see how the Quran builds transcendent, universalizable moral maxims, right. even in otherwise ethnic narratives. For example, Moses in the Quranic narrative, unlike the biblical one, is preaching monotheism to the Pharaoh. And in fact, God is very keen uh, when he sends uh, Moses and Aaron, they speak a gentle word to him, perhaps he will repent, meaning become a Muslim, which in quote the Quran, though not in the Bible, he does actually submit to God, but unfortunately a bit late, while he's drowning. Right. While he's drowning, he says, I now believe in the God of, um, of the children of Israel. And the Quran makes the comment that um, we have today um, uh, preserved you, Bibadnika, that we have preserved you today in the body that you may serve as a sign to those who come after you. A very puzzling verse of the Quran, which we now know what it means about 
the mummies and the preservation of the relics of Egypt. But these weren't known in the Prophet's time. Right. The Pharaoh has been preserved. Right. You know, archaeological remains. Because according to the Quran, the traveling and archaeology are didactic disciplines. They teach mm -hmm. you truths about the nature of God and repentance. Mabi says, Fasiru fil Yes. Travel on the earth and look what was the end of those who created corruption and were idolatrous. See, traveling yes. is didactic. Unfortunately, it's not didactic for most Muslims who even travel to Mecca and Medina just mm -hmm. to buy some gold. That's not the purpose of the Hajj, of course, as you know. Right, of course. And I mean, in the context of uh, of uh, Arabism or what you term Arabolatry, uh, yeah. I think yeah. it's, it's also relevant to discuss uh, or mention uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians and potentially what what lesson a Muslim can take from that. Yes, that's right. Well, my, my accusation is that, uh, of course, the Prophet himself, God forbid, or the Quran are not in any sense whatsoever racist. There's complete equality. Quran Surah 49 contains the famous a uh, verse about how we have created mankind and divided them into kabaila, uh, into into uh, you know uh, tribes, yeah, lita arafu, so they may recognize each other, but the best among them is the one who's most righteous in the eyes of God. That could be a black person, white person, somebody from Pakistan, Sudan, uh, you know, Lebanon. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, indeed, a convert. Uh, but uh, of course, in practice, there is an arabolatry, a uh, lot of uh, racism towards. Uh, let's say people of Pakistani origin in uh, some of the rich Gulf states. Uh, and as I'm sure that you you come across and everybody notices it. Right. But this is not, of course, attributed to the Prophet's holy example. The Prophet's companion, Salman al-Farsi, well, the Prophet was so fond of him, he was a Persian, that he used to call him a member of my uh, my family and showed love for him. And Bilal, the first Muslim, uh, was of course, uh, you know, uh, black. So uh, the Quran is uh, a remarkably fair document. I challenge anyone who is a non-Muslim to read Surah Fatiha. Apart from the fact that Surah Fatiha is in the Arabic language, what else is ethnic or racial about it? Not a single word or a single sentiment in that which is our equivalent to the Lord's Prayer. We, we recite it frequently every day, of course, in our Salah, which is canonically required. Not a single idea there is Arabocentric, behavioristically speaking. Of course, mm -hmm. the language of the Surah is Arabic, though it's not ordinary Arabic. As you know, it's a very special type of Arabic. Well, the Arabic of God's own uh, creation, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why it has puzzled commentators, some of the extraordinary way in which those sentiments are expressed. If you and I were to write those sentiments of Surah Fatiha, we wouldn't write them in that way. The, that's, those are remarkably... Uh, the, the unique expression. And in fact, expressions such as Alhamdulillah, which is how that should open, Alhamdulillah, mm -hmm. these are the most frequented elements of human speech in the history of all human speech. Mm -hmm. These words have been uttered more than anything in any language. Alhamdulillah, because mm -hmm. they've been uttered billions of times by billions of people for 1400 years. And don't forget, the Bible is a very important book, but it's not a recited in its original language of incidents, whereas we do recite the Quran in the original language of incidents, Arabic, the language of its first recipient, the Prophet. So we are in a very privileged position. Um, so the question of Arabolatry is about more tricky things. Like for example, the pilgrimage is to Mecca, which was according to the Quran, founded by Abraham. Obviously you can't have a pilgrimage that's rotating, let's say a, a pilgrimage in Jakarta, like we have a you know, uh, OIC conference that rotates into different Islamic capitals, Rabat in Morocco, in the Maghreb, and then we have it, let's say, next year in Islamabad. We can't do that. The Hajj is always in Mecca, al Mukarramah, right? So that's a difficulty. You know, negatively, right. you could say, well, that's a kind of Arabolatry. It privileges the Arab geographical site, and it does. Then, of course, you'd say, yes, but Abraham was not an Arab. So again, you see how the Quran is not racist in that way. Do you see my point? So there's right. lots of complexities. And yeah. another thing is about, you know, I mentioned about the universality of fictional characters or, or poetry by people like W.B. Yeats, which can be read by anyone anywhere on earth. Mm 
these are words in English poetry, but you can read them and sympathize with them and be moved by them, no matter what your mother tongue. The same is true, actually, when you look at the fact that the English language is the language of science by excellence. That doesn't mean that people who don't know English don't know how to write a paper in an academic scientific journal. You just write it in English. So the same is true of Arabic. If Arabic is chosen by God as the language of devotion and of the revelation of his will, his final will, testament, then it's an obligation on Muslims to learn it as a part of their religious duty, uh, as you and I have done. Uh, but it's not a duty to learn Amiya, because that would be true simply because you want to live and work in an Arab country. It's a marketable skill to be able to speak to uh, Muslim brothers in Egypt. But obviously it's not a religious duty. The religious duty is to be able to master the Quran and the Hadith. And that is important. And I see no reason why one shouldn't. And I, as I say, let's not exaggerate this point about the fact that right. the, the scripture is in Arabic. I mean, look at the fact that most literature on science and medicine is overwhelmingly in English. Does anyone therefore say, well, therefore it's irrelevant to the Russians? No, mm -hmm. we learn English because we can see why, you know, and how. Uh, I, I hinted at this earlier, that the reason why Arabic is not a language, uh, classical Arabic, not a, a language of Europe, unlike Latin and Greek, is partly due to prejudice against Muslims, but partly because the Muslims, unfortunately, fail to institutionalize the findings of science. What the Europeans did in the formation of feudal academia, like Oxford and Cambridge, um, University of Paris and so on, uh, and some Italian universities, Bologna, and some Spanish ones, they did institutionalize that learning. And that's why Europe is at the forefront uh, of science, while we, of course, can't even uh, create our own nuclear weapons. Right. Well, uh, before we move on to the next part of the discussion, um, I think, uh, oh, Professor, can you comment a bit about, uh, uh, th there's a segment in the book where you uh, discuss the, the authority of the scripture and, uh, and there's a discussion on error and what constitutes error in scripture. And then, then, then I mean, you, particularly in the, in the context of, of uh, biblical form criticism. So that is, that, which has been a way of accommodating some of these points. Because, I mean, let me put it in, in the context that, for example, you, you mentioned that uh, there are certain Quranic uh, accounts of the, for example, of, of the origin, where uh, it, it says that uh, the entire uh, human community was one before it got divided. Um, and you mentioned that these are empirically questionable points, potentially. Um, so how, how does one, I mean, uh, I, I suppose form criticism seems like, like a tempting way to uh, navigate through these kind of questions. Can you uh, elaborate on that, please? Oh, well, firstly, form criticism is not a good way to do it. Right. Uh, right. Not, none of the- it's, categories... it's a tempting one, that's what I was saying. That's right. Not, none of the categories of biblical criticism apply to Quran. I have resolutely refused to engage in any such attempt, please, with the Quran. Though I'm a philosopher and I'm trying to, and I'll answer your question in a minute, just to, just to again, remember the word theology, I never use it. I, I don't believe that right. biblical methods of redaction, form, source, and other types of criticism, low criticism, high criticism, all of which, of course, I have an expertise in because I right. wrote a commentary on Galatians, you have to master that. Uh, I don't think any of those methods apply to the Quran because the Quran is a text that was in fact preserved very faithfully. And we know, we know that the Bible went through a different evolution of edicts and massive changes, piecemeal, minor and large throughout um, the early centuries of Christianity for the canonization of the scripture, which was an external decision. The, Quran, the Bible nowhere self describes itself as revelation. It was a decision made by ecclesiastical councils that met in the first five centuries of the Christian faith. And this is not a controversial claim. Christians themselves, honest Christians, uh, and there are many of them, uh, great scholars have made this claim themselves. Now, in the area of the Quran, for the Quran, we have no need for a text of criticism of the Quran. We do have variant readings, 
and the text was defective in the sense it wasn't fully vocalized. It was a primitive consonantal text. That's quite true. Hebrews like that too. As you know, the Quranic uh, text has been vocalized to make sure they cannot be mispronounced. But we have an oral prototype of how it sounded because hifs of the Quran, oral hifs meaning preservation of the Quran, uh, predates its writing. People knew it at the time of the Prophet. So even if we say that the Quran was, um, um, I don't want to use the word emended or, or um, edited, uh, as a recension, these are incorrect words, all borrowed from parallel Christian sources. The Quran was codified, which simply means it was collated into, into a volume by under Osman's authority. Uh, but that doesn't mean he made editorial changes and said, oh, this bit shouldn't be there. Whereas the Bible has been altered in its, in its actual content. No such uh, equivalent of the Quran. We have some authorized variant readings, but they, they're not significant in how different they are. They're very minor differences. So that's the first point, that none of the categories of biblical criticism, higher or lower, apply to Quran. Second point is, yes, these are very complex uh, religious puzzles. For example, the Quran says that mankind were a single community for God raised prophets and that caused dissension and division. And uh, it's a puzzle, therefore. Uh, why did God uh, not allow the, uh, the human community to remain single? He allowed uh, dissension and conflict. Uh, that was caused by the sending of messengers. People then divided into groups, those who accepted uh, the faith and those who didn't. This contradicts the findings of secular anthropology, which says more or less that the evolution of the human religious instinct was from polytheistic animistic forces. And then eventually it, it uh, climaxed in the evolution of Hebrew monotheism, or which would be the two variants are Christianity and Islam. Though somebody might think that Christianity was a regression to a polytheism, concealed polytheism. Uh, so that's the first point, that we Muslims have to come up with a convincing alternative to secular anthropological claims that the religious consciousness of mankind went from animism, polytheism, and primitive types of belief in the location of spirits and stones and trees to the emergence of sophisticated um, uh, idea of a non-corporeal being was powerful. Whereas Islam suggests that the human history began with monotheism and then deteriorated into polytheism. It's the exact opposite. Burden is on us. Because right. we have to give up. And I'm trying to do that, by the way. Right. Not in that book. Uh, firstly, because I'm just one person. Uh, I can't wake up the entire slumbering Muslim Ummah where only a couple of people are awake. So it's a big task. Um, but I'm working on it and I'm doing some work uh, for Renovatio in Zetuna College, yeah, Dr. Oh, sorry, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and others have invited me to work on these ideas. But that's the first thing. Secondly, the Quranic claim, which is very problematic, that we have sent messengers into every human community to warn them. Again, empirically, it doesn't seem to be true. On the surface, were prophets sent to China? Was the Buddha a prophet? A very popular proposal right now, by the way, funded by some rich Arab countries. Um, but it doesn't or, seem like that. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem like that, that the Buddha was a monotheistic prophet on the, right. on the scale. So on the on the uh, model of, uh, let's say, Musa. Right. Or something. Right. With all the Quranic list is, uh, is restricted to prophets sent in the Near East, in the Middle East. You might say, well, that's because the Quran does not claim it's an exhaustive list. The Quran says we have sent prophets to every generation, uh, every community. It also says that we have not mentioned all these prophets, only mentioned some of them. It also says very wisely, in my view, that God has preferred some messages above others, but doesn't give the details of the ranking. I mean, we say, no doubt justifiably, in my view correctly, that the prophet is the greatest prophet. But the Quran doesn't make it into an explicit comment. It does say in Surah Ahzab that he is the Khatim and Nabiyin, the seal of the prophets, meaning no prophets will come after him. Um, but there are hadiths about the relative merits of different prophets. Obviously, Jesus is Al-Masih, is among the greatest, and Musa is very important, Ibrahim, and our prophet, of course, and others too, somewhat lesser, uh, Yusuf, etc. But what I'm saying is that because the list is not exhaustive or comprehensive, the list of messengers, it leaves open room for research. In fact, the Quran makes a very intriguing comment in uh, Surah Ibrahim, that there are some communities we've destroyed 
who only God is aware of. Well, what does that mean? The mm-hmm. limits of secular anthropology. If I spent my entire time looking for ruins, mm-hmm. I would still, ne- still never find these people. Well, that's very disheartening for me right. as an empirical thinker. I hope that answers your yeah. question. You rightly say, Saad, that a feature of my work is that I raise more questions by, than I answer. That's quite true. I present my opponent's opinion in the best, most charitable light. Then I try to refute it, not always successfully, which then has led to charges by my critics, such as uh, Pervez Manzur, who's also a very dear friend of mine. And Pervez Manzur is a brilliant critic of my work. And he says, well, you know, Dr. Shabir has given us all these things to think about. Fortunately, he's not answered any of them. And I, right. I feel that he's right about that. Yeah, that's quite true. Right. That's cool. Uh, I mean, just just to add to that list of uh, you know, uh, I mean, if, uh, you you're mentioning China. And I, I was also thinking about India, where I am. Yes. And, I mean, of course, here historically the record says that uh, for the past about five thousand years, I think uh, there hasn't been any. Uh, I mean, uh, prophet in the Quranic sense. I mean, th- then of course th- this also begs the question that uh, is the idea of prophet restricted to to that model of of the prophet for example the figures that are i mean i don't, I don't know I mean, this is this is all of course speculation but uh, uh, it is still something um, uh, i mean because this is the, we have at this point to to think about what what are the implications of the quranic statement that we have sent prophets to to every place either that means that these people who had come here were also prophets, or that or that statement isn't true, or, or or doesn't apply to this period. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm just I'm just speculating. Yeah, no, no, it's a very difficult conundrum. Um, obviously, the uh, uh, Quranic statement cannot be untrue. That would place me in yeah. the orbit of kufr, and uh, of I'm sure many of my critics would love to be able to send a fatwa <laughs> on me, since uh, I'm. Very- liberal with issuing fatwas against them. No, of course, I don't believe that. I, I, I do think it's a, a true statement. Right. The question is, we have to lift it beyond the level of pure assumption by faith. Mm-hmm. I therefore, I mean, personally, if I were running a think tank, if I had the resources, which I don't, then I would employ a team of uh, secular anthropologists to investigate these questions right. about ruins and archaeology to mm-hmm. find out what evidence there is that uh, Prophets have roamed the entire world yes. in places as distant as the, Australia and India and China. I mean, India and China were civilizations obviously mm-hmm. known to our prophet and at the time of the Quran's revelation. So why aren't they mentioned? Right. Yeah, that's, that's an important question, right? Well, uh, possibly because uh, the the Quran says that uh, if we would have mentioned other communities and they would have appeared foreign to the uh, initial uh, you know, audience. And then that would arguably defeat the purpose of addressing them in the first place. I mean, this well, is just a speculation. Well, that's true, but mentioning them is different from expounding them in detail. I mean, the Quran, for example, repetitively with detailed changes, uh, rehearses the narrative of Moses, presumably because Moses is the prophet closest in profile to our prophet. Moses was a statesman. Uh, you know, he led a community yeah, and uh, was a lawgiver, and meaning administrator of the law. And so was the prophet who had to implement those hudud, which were revealed in the Quran, uh, such as on that. So, yeah, you could say that it's relevant to its context. On the other hand, yeah. no last tract of the inhabited world does look odd to people who subsequently have encountered Islam as a faith. So they wonder why they're not mentioned in it. You know, when Islam goes to Indonesia, for example, the far eastern frontier of our faith, surely the Indonesians must feel a bit aggrieved that there's no Indonesian prophet mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, I mean, of course, very interesting. But I think we're also nearing our time. And uh, before we close, uh, there are a few more questions I, I would like to post to you. Yeah. So, well, uh, and there is a, a very interesting uh, section in the book uh, 
entitled the the varieties of rejection or varieties of disbelief i think where you pose the question of i mean there are a lot of these secular humanists or atheists or agnostics who are sincere people in our day and age uh, and right. would the quranic category of of kafir be uh, applicable in these cases uh, or should we be re- reconsidering how we apply that category or how we think about it yeah yeah that's right it's a very lengthy discussion right and i have also dealt with it in great academic depth in articles such as faust and the new idolaters what does it mean to be a, an idolater in the modern world uh, as opposed to the time when people worshiped uh, idols of stone and wood literal idolatry nowadays we have a metaphorical sense we say of a man or a woman we say you know that person there although he's very pious he prays his real god is money or his real god is sexual pleasure mm-hmm. we we're trying to criticize him we saying that he's not a proper believer that although he says allahu akbar god is greater when he marks the cycle of his prayer but he doesn't really believe in it even while he's genuflecting and prostrating he's actually thinking about the size of his bank balance he's distracted yeah we make that accusation i personally don't accept that accusation i don't think that's true i don't think that people are idolaters in that simple sense there are people who are explicitly idolatrous in the quran meaning they actually say hubo you know one of the gods you know, or allah one of the goddesses is greater than allah of the quran that was what the battles were about yeah remember the pagan arab tribes were naming some of their after the battle of uhud with the muslims lost the pagans of mecca brought out hubo one of the chief gods for a major procession in the streets to say that hubo was more powerful than allah the the, the god of the prophet of islam so that was an you know literal idolatry and it's found in semitic culture the israelites had the same problem that when they lost a the battle the philistines would bring out dagon and other deities and say look they are much more powerful powerful than yahweh yeah so that's the nature problem in the modern world you don't get people i mean secular humanists are told might say well the creed of islam la ilaha illallah is quite true there's no god but the bit at the end illallah the acceptive clause in arabic is what's wrong mm-hmm. la ilaha there's no god and of period there's nothing more to say there's no supernatural realm there's only what we can see and that's a much more radical rejection than the idolatry of the pagans because they did believe in allah as one of many gods which is what shirk mean they were mushrik right they weren't kafir only they were both so the question is is the modern rejecter mushrik no obviously not because he doesn't believe in any god not just that he associates that one true god with false gods he says there's nothing to dethrone there are no false deities because there are no deities either false or true it's a much more radical thing to deal with and um, as far as kufr is concerned which in the quranic root meaning means to conceal conceal something conceal the truth that's more tricky now because if you say of someone that they're concealing the truth it's a psychological accusation and we live in a psychologically very sophisticated age the other person says no it's not true now you are to contain the truth he says the believer you need a crutch you need something to believe in because your life is in a mess uh, to which you know the believer might say okay my life is empty so i pray your life is empty so you get drunk which is better yeah you know we can have polemical disputes yeah. at the cultural level because often atheists like rushdie say muslims leave lead empty lives and you say oh look who's talking you don't think your life is empty when it's filled with drugs and prozac and you know other um, antidepressants so right. that's a silly dispute that's cultural polemics against muslims there's no merit in that whatsoever uh, but the more difficult metaphysical dispute is whether we should have a new category that conquers uh, sorry that captures the quranic accusation about kufr and shirk and i propose one is to is to dal which is a complex uh, verb in arabic augmented which means substitutionism that could we say that this person is substituted not associated not sure he has substituted wealth for god so that wealth has become his god 
So this person, I always joke with my with my Muslim friends at the mosque that uh, if someone uh, offered a burial service, not just for the corpse of the dead man, but a, a big enough grave to uh, accommodate the houses and restaurants he had, all his material wealth. It's a joke, meaning we've become so materialistic that we think we're going to take this with us, right? And uh, sometimes people don't get the joke and, because sadly we don't have a sense of humor, at least not in the mosque. <laughs> Others get the joke and think, oh, he's mocking Islam. And I'm not. I'm just saying that we have a different... What I'm saying is the Quranic accusation does not in any sense traumatize the kafir of today, the secular humanists. Because as you mentioned earlier, uh, my, my point is that many secular humanists lead good lives morally, uh, whereas many devout Muslims uh, who are not really devout, but just pretending hypocritical Muslims, they lead very morally unworthy lives. But of course they talk a lot about Islam all the time, they're constantly preaching and many of them have long beards and so on. And we know that they're fake, right? Uh, so that's a difficulty we have to contend with. My own explanation for this phenomenon is that it is possible for a man or a woman to live coincidentally in accordance with the will of God. What may be called anonymous Muslims, right. to borrow a term from Catholic theology. Mm -hmm. Carl Rayner said that many people who are very good human beings and morally good, they're anonymous Christians. But of course, that's a kind of insult. It's like saying to a Buddhist who is very virtuous and charitable, you know, you think you're a Buddhist, actually unknown to yourself, you're a Muslim. That's why I'm not willing to colonize a, a previous sacred history and say to the Buddhists that the Buddha was really a Muslim. I think right. it's a kind of concealed insult. We right. have to do a lot of our homework properly before we can recruit some of these people and say they were Muslim prophets. Right. And I mean, that idea of uh, the, you know, anonymous Muslim uh, also, uh, I mean, potentially could be accommodated with the, with the idea of fitra that we have. And, yes, that's uh, true. Right. Everyone is born Muslim right. uh, on the fitra, Allah fitra, uh, that Allah created. So, so 30 verse 30, very famous. And the prophetic hadith, whose authenticity I think is sahih, uh, genuine. Uh, or at least very hustle or strong, that every child is born Muslim, but then his parents, through nurture, turn him into a, a fire worshiper or a Jew or a Christian, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's correct. You can you can link the two. A lot of work needs to be done on this. And the Quran does say that before the start of empirical history, all the souls of the children of Adam were assembled at a primordial covenant where they were asked by God Allah to be here. Uh, and they said, Bala, Shahidana. Yes, we testify. In other words, when they entered actual history with bodies, like I've got a male body, a woman has a female body, then they are put to the test about their faith because they already believe in one God. But something in their culture and nurture has actually perverted them into believing into a rival religion, including polytheism. Right. Including hedonism, which is a kind of, you know, I was joking with, with people at the university that uh, somebody asked me whether Christianity was a bigger religion numerically than Islam. And I said, well, unfortunately, it doesn't matter. The biggest religion in the world is capitalism. Everybody's into shopping, whether you're in the United Arab Emirates or in Peru. We all have one religion now. It's called capitalism. Yes. Shopping. Shopping. Of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah and I mean, uh, when we're talking about uh, the you know, modern atheist or the secularist, uh, you also mentioned, and this is a point which also comes up in your article on Renovatio, on the silence of God, uh, where you mentioned that, uh, uh, I mean, theism and, and atheism are total syst systems of thought. And uh, they have these mechanisms where they can potentially accommodate any counter argument against them and then make it part of their system once it comes. So, I mean, potentially uh, philosophy or pure reason might not resolve the theism atheism divide. And uh, there is something, uh, I mean, so, I mean, this, this, I suppose, puts things into perspective in terms of what is the role of reason in, in persuading the disbeliever or the, uh, you know, uh, uh, interlocutor in, uh, Towards your case, right? Yeah, that's correct. 
the idea that uh, uh, the, um, uh, the for every phenomenon there's a an adequate uh, secular naturalistic explanation is very important because um, if you say of any event that believers, for example, let's take the case of Moses and the burning bush. Secularists say that it's a phenomenon in the desert of certain kinds of plants which conceal oil when the, uh, the rays of the sun strike it at a certain angle. They look from a distance as if they're burning, a bit like a mirage in a desert. That's not a miracle, it's a natural optical illusion. And that these optical illusions were subsequently mistaken for miracles. So there's always an adequate secular explanation for anything that the believers claim is a miracle, meaning an intervention in the laws of nature by supernatural agent called God. That's a problem. It's a, it's a real difficulty now because we live in an age in which science is the primary form of social authority. So believers, unlike in previous ages where atheism was on the defensive, now belief is on the defensive. So we have to argue our case and it, it puts a major burden on us. Um, well, of course, the Quranic position is that reason is subordinate to faith. So you can use reason in the service of faith. You can't use unaided reason, unaided by revelation to undermine or subvert faith. And that's a religious position. But the opposite opinion that reason should be unaided and lead to wherever it leads you implies that reason has no limits, that reason has no uh, limitations of any kind. That's also not a correct view, as we all know from the rest of our lives. We don't we don't lead any aspect of our lives purely on reason. I mean, how many of us, for example, measure things about someone says to us, "Do you can you really trust your friends? Do you really uh, love your wife?" Nobody subjects that to a scientific or mathematical algorithm. You obviously go by intuition and by complex evidence which is subject to controversial interpretation. And you say, yes, I believe so-and-so is a true friend of mine. Doesn't mean that he won't betray you. You know what I'm saying? So of course, uh, the decision about the nature of the world is ultimately right. in that complex category. It's not in the category of a mathematical theorem, such as two plus two equals four, quad erat demonstrandum. It's been demonstrated you know, beyond reasonable mm -hmm. doubt as the same law. You can only make a case, a cumulative case. And I think the case for Islamic monotheism is the strongest in the entire history of human ideas. It's the greatest idea that has ever illuminated human history. But then a non-believer, an atheist like the late Christopher Hitchens would say, well, that's just prejudice on your part because you're a believer. But I don't actually personally dismiss the minds of great thinkers like Nietzsche, whom I engage with and have done since I was a teenager. Uh, I, I admire Nietzsche. I think that if you can uh, refute Nietzsche's ideas about the nature of God and religion, then you have earned the right to be a conscientious um, disbeliever. You know, if you can show. That's the difficulty. See, the Quranic mind does not encompass the idea of a, a righteous or uh, a conscientious disbeliever. Some Sunnis say, well, Abu Talib was like that. Shias deny that. They, you know, he, he supported the cause of Islam and the Prophet himself, but he didn't become a, a Muslim. So perhaps he was a kind of conscientious pagan, you know, a good pagan, right? Uh, we don't know that. Uh, but the Quranic net does not catch that kind of modern nuance that we need to catch. So, you know, all the thinking has not been done for us by God. We need to think too. That's our task. That's something I've engaged in single-handedly uh, for all my academic life. Right. And I think this, uh, I mean, the this brings us, of course, to the importance of of thinking that that we need to do, and the importance of philosophy. And to yes. the, the end of the book, we talk about a, a preface for a philosophy of Islam. Uh, but I mean, before we go on to that concluding part of the discussion, uh, th there's there's another interesting point in the article on Renovatio where. Uh, where I mean, in, in the context of talking about the limited role of reason in terms of uh, resolving our uh, doctrinal differences, you say that ultimately, uh, of course, this is a Quranic verse where uh, ultimately God will inform us on the on the day of resurrection about who was right and and, and who was uh, wrong, and I mean, so there seems to be at least I mean from 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 certain Quranic verses and. Perhaps from your own argument as well that uh, 
there seem, seems to be this sense that uh, ultimately uh, reason or rational discourse might not resolve the uh, issue of uh, doctrinal veracity or who is right and which is what is true and false, uh, even though it might help us. But, but ultimately, uh, as per the verse in Surah Maida, it is competition in righteous living that is the uh, sole uh, you know, test of, of your system or way of life. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. There are enduring stalemates and deadlocks between the people of the book, Jews and Christians, and the new community of Islam. That's the context of the verse that you mentioned about buy with each other, compete with each other in righteous action, because it admits that the doctrinal deadlock is here. Professor John Hick, the late Professor John Hick, great thinker, yeah. one of my uh, uh, teachers, actually, mentor, he had the idea of post mortem eschatological verification. The idea is that when you die, you find out uh, that you were right or that you were wrong. Yeah. Of course, if atheism is true, uh, there's oblivion. So nobody will be in a position to rejoice and say, I was right, or be sad and say, I was wrong. But if Islam is true, then Judaism and Christianity are partly true. On the other hand, if Christianity and Judaism are each partly true, uh, sorry, are each wholly true, then it means that Islam is only partly true. Okay, so if, for example, I die and, you know, find a figure looking recognizably by, like Jesus Christ, surrounded by his worshippers, then I think, oh my God, I made a big mistake. He is the God, and I thought he was just a Messiah. On the other hand, Christians who die and find that the Prophet Muhammad is leading a community and they're entering paradise, and other people, well, I don't know where they'll end up, but let's say they're going to hell. Um, then, you know, obviously it's a matter for some concern. Yeah. <laughs> One is upset. Uh, not to be flippant, but this is a serious point that only death will decide. And the Quran admits this doctrinal stalemate when it says that you shall continue to dispute even in the presence of your Lord on the Yom al Qiyamah. The implication is that these problems cannot be resolved. If they, in other words, the, what the Quran is actually saying there is that if even the revelation of the Holy Quran has not managed to disambiguate the situation of the ambivalence of the of nature and of the warring factions of different types of believers, then obviously nothing else will. And therefore you'll have to wait till you die. And you'll die soon enough anyway. I mean, uh, you know, average human life is 70 years. You can, you can mock Islam during those years like Ayan Hirsi Ali does uh, and has made a good living out of it. But you'll soon find out when she dies that... Uh, she will be judged by the God of Islam. Right. And I think in, in conclusion, Professor, uh, can you speak uh, a little bit about uh, the need for uh, thinking about these issues and the need for a philosophy of Islam? Yes, I can. Right. Uh, and by the way, we've we got about 15, 20 minutes. Right. Yeah, I can discuss this in two parts because there's something that we didn't cover which is, this is the right place to cover it. Um, there's a chapter uh, in the first part of my book apart from a very long introductory chapter talking about the need for reform and what reform actually means and not the propagandist use of the word progressive Islam which I think is basically a way of emasculating Islam while pretending to be Muslim. It's right. effective uh, apostasy. Yeah? Um, let me just cover two areas that are related, uh, if I may, so, and then tell you about what I proposed in the last chapter of the book, which is the future of Islam. Because remember, there's two projects I'm doing in this very complex book, which is over 400 pages long in dense print. So it's, mm. so it's something that can be discussed in many seminars, not just one. Uh, firstly, I had two projects. One was the attempt to... Um, assess Quranic claims using the, the criteria and measure of modern analytical Western philosophy. Yeah, that was my aim. So what the Quran says about idolatry, about the prevalence of messengers and secular history, I was putting it at the bar of critical secular reason and saying, how would an atheist read this? Would he just mock these claims? Would he be challenged by them? And if he's not convinced by them, then the burden is on the Muslim philosopher like myself to convince the atheist. 
right? So that's what I meant by the philosophy of Islam, subtitle. The other thing is Islamic philosophy itself, which of course, as you know, can be done by non-Muslims. You know, Arabic Hellenic philosophy, mm -hmm. Greek philosophy was done by many people, including very able, you know, Christian thinkers who translated these uh, Greek texts into Arabic. And it was done in parallel uh, by Maimonides, the great uh, uh, Jewish thinker who was a, a very devout Jew. In fact, my view of the failings of the Muslim tradition, I briefly mentioned the Yaqub al-Kindi, but then you have to, I didn't have time to mention the work of Ibn Sina and um, uh, Abu Hamid al-Razali uh, and uh, later thinkers such as um, um, Ibn Taymiyyah and perhaps the last and the greatest, uh, uh, well, of course, earlier than Ibn Taymiyyah, I should mention Ibn Rushd, but in my view, the, 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 the end of the Sunni philosophers, uh, not Shia, there's a different tradition. It doesn't interest me at all. Uh, but the last of the Sunni philosophers, Ibn Khaladun, whose uh, theory of the philosophy of history is part of, mm -hmm. in my view, important philosophy. So the question is, can we revive that tradition? Um, or are there defects in that tradition? I think there are serious defects in what the so-called Muslim philosophers are doing. Um, with the exception of Al-Ghazali, who was actually an anti-philosopher. He was trained as a philosopher, but he used this technique to refute any impious elements in the philosophies of other uh, thinkers before him and indeed uh, after him, in the case of the Rushd, right? Remember, incoherence of the philosophers, yes. Al incoherence of the incoherence mm. of the philosophers, a work by the later thinker, Ibn Rushd. So let's uh, be clear that if we do want to revive the tradition of Sunni Islam, uh, Islamic philosophy, which I'm doing, I have done with this book in a modest way, then that doesn't mean that we simply repeat what the errors of uh, people such as Ibn Sina, um, you know, who's uh, uh, an Al-Farabi, both of these two gentlemen, their uh, account of the psychology of inspiration misled uh, Fazlur Rahman, who studied these two in his doctorate at Oxford. Yes. The psychology of inspiration, that's what misled him right. into plus views. So I'm not saying a, a, a imitative, Revival. It has to be critical. That's the first point. Secondly, the idea is that if we exercise the intellect without the supervision of faith, that's fine. But then you mustn't pretend that you're a Muslim philosopher. Question is, in this compound expression, Muslim philosopher, are you really a philosopher? Many philosophers accuse me of not being a true philosopher because they say when reason leads you away from Islam, you stop there. And many Muslims have said, you have too much respect for independent secular Greek reason. You're not a true Muslim. So you get accused from both sides by ignorant people, of course. They're foolish people who make these accusations. That's because they've not read my book. Yeah. And perhaps many of them are incapable of understanding its depth and subtleties. Right. That, that's one set of issues. Mm. I briefly touched on the question of, in the first part of the book, I deal with the survey of what Islam is, uh, problems it's encountering. I look at the question of faith and reason, where I look at the history of the received tradition of Sunni, uh, Arabic, Hellenic philosophy, and make comparison with Maimonides, whom I admire immensely. In fact, I regard him as a much greater philosopher than any of the Muslim philosophers. I think he was much more pious and faithful to his religion than any of the Muslim philosophers were to their faith, with the exception of Al-Kindi. Um, anyway, a lot more on this in the book, as you know, I'm sure you've read it, yeah? Especially on Ibn Rushd, whom I debate in considerable depth. Now, the other topic is uh, that when we look at the future, and I'll talk about this for about 10 minutes, so about the future of philosophy, is that okay? Among yes. Muslims? And yes. I'll conclude our discussion. Because yes. then I've said everything I want to. Right. And uh, one, one final yes. question st still remains, yes. Professor, if, if possible, last one or two minutes. Uh, yeah which was about your writing style. So, which is yeah, something yeah. entirely I'll give, distinct, yeah. I'll give you my, 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 my uh, views on uh, how to write of with course. style and precision, which sadly very few people do. Right. Academics are very poor writers. I right. wish there was a law prohibiting them from writing. Right. They write terribly dull books. Um, but I'm a thinker, not an academic. You know, I, I deal with big ideas. Um, now, let, let's, let me put it this way, that when we're looking at the future of Islamic philosophy as a genre, I would 
uh, tie it much more closely to the revival of continental philosophy, existentialism, for example, the work of uh, mm. thinkers like Soren Kierkegaard, on whom I did a doctorate and published it. Uh, so I'm not too keen that a revival of Islamic philosophy should be entirely in the Anglo-American, Scandinavian analytical tradition. I think it's too narrow, too academic, in the negative sense that it's mainly pointless and trivial, just a pastime for people. As you can tell from my book, these are real questions that should agitate uh, believers. One issue we didn't get time to discuss, there's many things we did, is theodicy, justifying uh, the existence of evil in a world in which God is powerful and merciful. So why doesn't he prevent the incredible atrocities and cruelty? A great deal of it visited on Muslims right now as I speak in Rohingya and Serbia and, and other troubled spots, Kashmir and Chechnya. Look at the table things that Muslims suffer. Why doesn't God intervene? Uh, that's a very good puzzle. Not much in Islamic thought, but that's a burden on us. The Silence of God, my article, was on the development of a theodicy uh, using modern natural theology. But of course, a big task, and I may not have succeeded. So there are many things we'll need to do, uh, so, uh, in order to develop a convincing genre of Islamic philosophy that non-Muslims will take seriously, uh, particularly in my contribution to the philosophy of religion, which will be on this question of revealed theology, natural theology, sorry to use the word theology, but I'm using it with cautionary quotation marks because it's an accepted term. I don't accept it myself. Um, but the idea of how to prove the existence of God using evidence in nature was called the teleological argument that there's a telos or purpose in nature and that implies there must be a designer who is a, a, super, a super mind as it were, an idea that Hume very brilliantly in my view debunked so we have to answer Hume. I don't, by the way, in criticizing David Hume, say that he wasn't a great philosopher. I just said that he was guilty of double standards on one particular point, on the origins and instinctive basis, psychological basis for the monotheistic impulse in human beings. I think he was wrong about that. So do you see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to engage existing philosophers wow. in the Western tradition, particularly the existentialists like Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, Sartre, you know, and um, and then develop a genre of philosophy that has got something uniquely Islamic about it, but is also rigorous, analytical, thoughtful, and yet the person has to remain a believer. Sadly, I have not come across many allies in this field because I don't have any Muslims. Firstly, Muslims don't go to university to study philosophy. They study law and uh, economics and accounting, which is fine. But it does mean that we don't have anyone to defend our faith against these very profound uh, uh, objections. Uh, any any question specifically on this point before I move on to the final point about method and style, Saad? No, I think that uh, pretty much sums it up. Uh, okay. And, yeah. All right. Yeah. Then, then let me talk about style. Yeah? Yes. Because actually you, you've spoken a lot about style yourself because you interrogated me about, you know, the Quran claiming to have supremacy of literary taste. So why does literary taste matter? Right. Well, you could say, of course, it uh, is important because if you want to make an argument, not only valid, and the Quran has many very powerfully rigorous arguments about why we should uh, not prioritize this dunya and prioritize the akhirah. It gives you actual arguments, sound arguments with you know, sound premises, valid syllogism, which I've discussed in other papers I've written for al Yaqeen, uh, a series on human nature and why we should be motivated to believe in the Akhirah and to lead a virtuous life of self-restraint. But apart from these, the Quran is known for its aesthetic appeal and beauty. Uh, and I personally think that any good writer uh, should also be concerned about style and precision and concision. So I try and write in a way that discusses very difficult subjects and makes them accessible through the style and the charm of the writing. How does one achieve that and why does one want to achieve that? Well, why is obvious because no message will appeal to people because we're not simply robots uh, or rational beings. We have emotional lives. I'm a poet as well as you know, published poet. I think poetry is important for that reason. Poetry mm -hmm. has been called the mother tongue of the human race. Everybody understands poetry. 
It's not a language in a linguistically restricted sense. It means it plays on your emotions. And everybody understands the power of emotions, even if you don't speak that language. You can tell when somebody's talking about a subject that's close to their heart. You know, they may have tears in their eyes or they may look in a distant way towards the horizon. Uh, as I'm sure you know, you know, a poet can look when they're trying to debate or talk about mm. something that, you know, close to them. So the first thing is the style and uh, precision need to be combined. You can't have style at the cost of precision. I'm a philosopher, so I'm rigorous, as you can tell from the quality of the argument. But I believe in using interesting phrases that the reader won't forget, rhetorical style. Yeah. Uh, how do you attain that? Well, obviously, you must be widely read. Uh, you must read many different languages. I have a multilingual scholarship. I know many languages, um, mostly sadly dead ones like classical okay. Greek and biblical yeah. Hebrew and, yeah. and Latin, which all the Latin is useful if you want to talk to the Holy Father in the Vatican. But most of the time, of course, they're, they're not important. But I have enough, uh, you know, living languages too, obviously Arabic, but my mother tongue, uh, Punjabi and Urdu. So broad reading, not only in prose, but in poetry of many different languages will help you to make your uh, style sharp and precise and concise. The other thing is to read outside your field. Uh, most academics read increasingly about a narrow field. So the result is they become very skilled in one narrow and rather boring subject, which nobody's interested in apart from themselves. Uh, and this is why, and I'll end on this point, the greatest paradox and deficiency and deficit in modern academia, including the Western academia, is that all seminal ideas in the humanities particularly are created and established and thought out outside the academy, sadly in prison, in activism, in caves, like the founders of religions. But the academy is good at analyzing existing ideas that have been created elsewhere. That's mm -hmm. the greatest failing of the academy in the area of the humanities. It should okay. give pause for people uh, that when they think about prophecy, but they're not end on this, yeah. that how is it that God never chose any academic philosopher or theologian to become a prophet? All the prophets were simple men uh, who were sometimes illiterate, and many of them were shepherds. They weren't uh, university professors. Well, you might say there weren't any universities then, but God could have chosen people who were primarily men of the intellect, but he didn't, and we know why. Thank you. Right. No, I think uh, these are really uh, uh, you know, concerning questions. Um, and, uh, be and before we conclude, I just want to mention that uh, uh, Professor uh, Akhtar's website, uh, shabirakhtar.com, a link to which will be provided uh, in the description, uh, is available for if you, if you want to look at his, his other books and his other work and his articles. Uh, and uh, I will also be uh, putting in the links to, of course, the Quran and the Secular Mind, as well as uh, the professor's recent republication of Be Careful with Muhammad. And I mean, speaking of which, again, uh, I think it, it, was, it was, again, uh, a book which you wrote when, when you were quite, quite young yourself. Uh, and, uh, That's true. I was. I was in my late 20s. So... Right. It's a great honor to have been able to, to be chosen to defend the Prophet's honor. Where were all the other Muslims? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And I mean, specifically in, in that context, uh, this is again uh, a, bit, uh, a bit of a personal question, but uh, being able to produce a, a book like that at that age, uh, what was, I mean, what, what, what goes into that? process well it was, apart from what you what you already mentioned of course well i mean by that time i was you know i had a doctorate and yes cambridge, cambridge education all that but the main thing was i had um, by god's grace i had both courage right. meaning passion for my faith and ability you know no good having intellect if you don't have the courage to exercise it right, right. and there may be um a people um uh, who had courage and, you know, didn't have the intellect. So to have a combination where you're brave enough to stand for an idea and you know how to uh, expound it in a way that is challenging, well, that's a rare combination. Right. Uh, I mean, I don't exaggerate my role, by the way, because I, this is a subject, my book on politics, I don't actually 
think that thinkers matter to a religion and its health. Right. Uh, they matter up to a point only. What really matters is people who are willing to lay down their lives in the cause of God, meaning to be martyrs. And of course, I, I never laid down my life for God. I just did a modest job of defending the honor of the prophet and it uh, made it very difficult for me to earn a living because I come from a poor family. Mm -hmm. And so that required a lot of iman and uh, courage and faith. And uh, that, that's a gift of God. Mm -hmm. It's not given to everyone. Yeah, and uh, I mean, speaking of early books, I think your book, uh, Faith for All Seasons, was also written quite early on. And I, and I think in, yes. in, many, in many respects, it is, it, it is uh, I mean, uh, it, it seems like a, uh, uh, you know, pre-sentiment of uh, the Quran and the secular mind. I mean, many of the themes over there are developed, uh, I suppose, more fully in this book. Yeah, you, you could say it was an early youthful attempt to... Uh, write about the need for a reverent skepticism about orthodoxy. Actually, I wrote the book under pressure because after my book on Rushdie was published, mm -hmm. I was largely seen as a, a murderer, uh, somebody who went around uh, arranging fatwas. And of course, I have no such power. I don't have a direct link to the Ayatollah Khomeini. But I had to write such a book to show that I was quite capable of nuanced philosophical thinking and I was trained as a philosopher. But the need of the hour was for Be Careful Muhammad, which is a book of mm -hmm. activism. And I had the skills of philosophy, but I didn't display them. So I was under pressure from my critics. You know, who thought he just doesn't know how to uh, argue, really. Uh, you know, he could just write a journalistic work against Rishti. So I said, no, I'm very much conversant with Western academic analytical philosophy. Indeed, um, I'm a professional philosopher. And here's the proof of that. So that's actually why, how the book came about. Um, in the genesis of the book, it was an attempt to say that a person who's a real believer and has the courage to stand for his faith uh, also does not, has also got the ability to think. But there's very little occasion to show that side. So it was easy to get the book into print. The Faithful Season was widely published in America as well as here. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, my book of Faithful Seasons was endorsed by no less a person than Graham Greene. Mm. Wow. He read it, yeah. And he, he approved of the book. He thought it was a, well, he thought it was a good book. Right, amazing. Well, uh, Professor, thank you for your generous time. And uh, I'd just like to remind the audience that uh, both these books are uh, worth engaging uh, carefully and uh, worth uh, reading. Well, I think that's, uh, that's, that's all for this discussion. Perhaps we can have another one in the future, inshallah. Yes, uh, thank you, Saad. I'm very happy to uh, debate with you again. You asked me some uh, very probing questions and I, I hope that the viewers, uh, as I the, the listeners will uh, be able to engage with the quality of the argument. But as you say, you know, a book of 425 pages can't be summarized in two hours. Of course, yes. So we, we will look forward to uh, future engagements uh, on your work, inshallah, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Sal Ismail. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you.